Pharisees, and then about three days later, he posts this whole satire, obvious satire of me. He was inspired to write this fucking crazy <laughs> Bob guy, and uh, he calls him Bob, and uh, it never got, I don't know if anybody saw it, but he posted it, and I'd never seen it again, but he, I would, Zappa, I'd come and visit Zappa, I'd lay out whatever crazy stuff I was doing, outrageous claims, and then he'd fucking use that to write a screenplay to make fun of me. I'd inspire him for his absurdity. <laughs> <laughs> it's just coming to me now. Did you talk to him um, about cosmic awareness? Was he aware that you were working? Oh, yeah. Uh, I told, working? I was, yeah, I, told him, I, I read him what Cosmic Awareness said about his work. You know, I had, I had uh, Cosmic Awareness described, and it was very good. He actually didn't say much to that. It described him doing a texture of tactility. That's what Cosmic Awareness said. And uh, I read it to him, and, uh, and uh, he, he didn't say anything. He, he was stunned. <laughs> so all, all this Cosmic thing is about Bob. Yeah, his boss. I mean, he, he does the evergreens, uh, but I do the evergreens on him. He, he does that later, you know, in the 80s. It's an evergreen satire. He, every decade is satire, Bob going through some quadrant. Because you're so far out. You're so heavy. Yeah, that's right. Like Ray says, you're the most absurd human on the planet, Bob. Ray said that within 30 seconds of conversation. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, that was in your okay, recent so, conversation with Ray. Yeah, that a few was, hours ago just, this morning. <laughs> I hadn't talked to him in in two or three years, and I I started talking. I said about thirty seconds of something. And he said, "Jesus Christ, Bob, you're the weirdest guy on the planet." He said something like that. <laughs> immediately, two and two is seventy-five. You know, immediately escalated his judgment of me. I hadn't even started. <laughs> It's like he has ESP. He knew where it was going. Yeah, you have to tell okay. him you don't understand. On the, on the yeah, <laughs> understand. <laughs> you understand. Uh, Gwyn. I'm Gwyn going to give you a blowjob, you black caucus <laughs> imitator. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am not a bayonet. I want to be a force link. Yeah, force league. We, we yeah. believe in force fields. Yeah. Yeah, it's like all along, uh, Ion's been picking my brain, only my brain. And everything he gets, it comes from Bob's brain. <laughs> he like, <laughs> love. He meant to say force league. He says love is a force league, but he said force field. Then he was stuck to it. Stuck with it. <laughs> Jeez, I got to find this particular. Um, where is it? Incredible thing. Uh, let me play um, some music for a minute. Play some zap. Play flambe. You know, just give me a break. <laughs> I get a drink. Here I am performing. Your wonderment. Of, my wonderment. <laughs> your Roxy's wonderment. got a whole bunch of new words she could use. So I, I, I really TV. love this. This type of you like this? This is entertaining to a, a Mexican princess. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Stranded in Berlin. Now, uh, um, I got an audience of two here. So yeah, go get your mystery burger. <laughs> oh, what, what I got to do is ask Bill the stats. How many people are listening on computer? Let's see what that is. I talked to Bill today. Um, he said he's usually up for most of it. Oh, man, here's Gene. Gene's been writing commentary all along. Let's see what Gene... No, I'll do that after... I've got to get a drink. <laughs> what? Forsling, Gene. Forsling. Yes, look at, look at this driving... <laughs> <laughs> the sub-genius Zap is bringing the sub-genie out of Roxy. Roxy's going to get worse and worse. Uh, okay, over here... Uh, so we we go down to flam my my computer inventory of twelve hundred Zappa songs. There it is, Flambe. I don't know what it sounds like. Can't remember, but I will play it through the computer. Did is everything ready to go? Um, I don't even have to mute you guys. Doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> 
You can make all the noise you want. I'm just playing it for you. So here's Flambe from the album Sleep Dirt, 
and it slipped into 20 small cigars. That was the very lyrics I was reading. Did you recognize it? No. no. <laughs> Did you hear the word Hutch and Toot? Did you hear, hear her say Hutch and Toot? You didn't hear it? Yeah, I did hear that, yes. It, it was her being lonely and, and wanting ecstasy from Hutch and Toot. Well, you just made me stop I was reading. <laughs> ah, I, I haven't heard that in 20 years. I haven't played that much. And uh, I wouldn't have known back then what the fuck it was about. It's fragments from this one big play. Fragments, for fuck's sake. Like, what, what does that mean? You hear this on an album mixed with other kinds of music. We'll play another one, Spider of Destiny. Um, so these fragments, and he's not talking about Hutchin' Toot that I knew of, you know, publicly. You don't even know it's a part of a opera skit. So I found the good part, but let, I'm just going to play um, Spider of Destiny. I remember there was a, see what that is. Yeah. yeah, it's it's from the same album, Spider of Destiny, 1979, Sleep Dirt. Oh, I forgot, I gotta put the sound off. Oh, let's see, Bill's answered. That's Bill. Panic button. Okay. Here we go. Listen carefully, spider of destiny. You must see the call of cosmobiology. Listen to me. If you will see your dreams now, things will all be fine. goes into this town as a sealed tuna sandwich. So that was Spider of Destiny. That's a kind of texture or tone I've never heard before. That's a whole different Frank music. Yes, what do you think? Yes, Yeah. Yes, uh, that's something he, he does a lot with his solos. He plays the guitar as um, 
if the guitar was speaking and and here it's very clear because the yeah. the voice is is doing the mm. same as the guitar right and you right. have the, the impression that the guitar is also speaking hey listen i just had a little spooky insight you can go on howionic.com and listen to Ion describe how Captain Beefheart or Don Van Vliet faked his death and how he came from another world or another planet or something like Sun Ra, not exactly Sun Ra, but he was a strange guy who came from another world. Well, in this 1964 play, all the way through it, the character known as Captain Beefheart, this is what he says, I'm magic and I can make myself invisible and fly through time and space and other dimensions, and that's how I got here. Mm. Fucking 2,000-year-old Frank <laughs> knew Don, exactly what Don had done, and there are people from other worlds, and, and, and Frank just writes it out literally in the fucking play, and everything is all made up, but it's fucking just autobiographical. These two guys were met, fucking when weird they were teenagers. people. It, it's yeah. like these uh, teenagers. The yeah. David Lynch characters, like the cowboy, is very weird. They're 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 a cowboy. Like what's that about a cowboy? Uh, there is a movie, uh, Mulholland Drive, from David. Oh Lynch. yeah, the cowboy in that. I played that part. Yeah, I know what that you mean. Weird uh, characters that. And, and Frank yeah, lived just off of Mulholland Drive. He lived in Woodrow Wilson Drive, which, which at the top, Laurel Canyon Boulevard goes up and meets Mulholland Drive, which goes along the top of the hills. And right where Laurel Canyon Boulevard meets Mulholland Drive, you turn a sharp right and you go along Woodrow Wilson Drive to his home, where his studio was. He's right, at, he's right beside Mulholland Drive. Yeah, maybe that's... Um like a portal or something like that. Yeah. Because Hollywood is full of weird characters and vampires and angels and <laughs> who knows what. And he's writing about these guys. Uh, in, in, in this uh, play in 1964, somebody, what's his name, um, old somebody, this old janitor guy, he, Billy Sweeney, he's so pissed off, he's an old janitor, he is going to single-handedly beat the United States government to the moon. He's going to make his own rocket ship and get there first. <laughs> Pretty ambitious. He's going to whoop their ass. Okay, now here's where, something I wanted to read to you. It's really important. So Zappa, it was when Pons and Fleischmann announced their cold play, cold fusion in 89, uh, there was interest from Frank. He was sort of rumored to be interested in it. i have been telling him a bit about this and that. But so he was, I don't know if he followed how much he checked into it. But look at this. In 1984, in the Themras book, in chapter 3, starts off this way. One month later, in the computer lab, Buddy walks through a maze of equipment discussing technical matters with a guy named Hertzberg. In brackets, a design engineer in his early 30s, already balding, with one of those cheesy little beards that computer guys always grow. Hertzberg has a theory. And it says, Hertzberg arrogantly says, P to E conversion is a process whereby cheap and plentiful photons are disguised in a way that makes the old-time electron-munching machineries think they are getting the right stuff to eat. But he responds, I swear y'all ain't getting enough sleep, Hertzberg. Just stop watching them old science fiction movies on the TV for a while, and maybe that little beard you got grown there might actually turn into something one day. Hertzberg says, sleep has nothing to do with it. A genius such as myself requires very little rest. Now, you know, Zappa seemed to operate with very little sleep. A genius such as myself requires very little rest. My metabolism is vastly different from that of the average individual. Now, listen to this. If we think of an electrical circuit like some kind of tiny dry plumbing, and if we think of the electrons that whiz around in there like they were just a bunch of fast dots pretending to be some kind of dry water in the tiny dry plumbing, then P to E conversion becomes fiendishly simple to deal with. Until that glorious day when the entire planet runs on photonic energy, my P to E converter will stand proudly next to the personal disposable gas mask 
as the great item which took up the slack between the electronic age and the photonic age. That's fucking Coldplay. Ironed them. <laughs> wow. Wow. Is that stunning, Roxy? <laughs> get off that bed. Yay. Stop twiddling your vagina. Get the fuck over here. Well, yeah, that, that, that spider it. made me. That spider made me horny. Yeah, <laughs> all those tiggly tactile gangling danglia. Yes, any self-respecting Mexican princess would respond to that. Thanks to. Tanjo Vila, or whatever his name was. What was the name of the guy in 1910? Zapata? What was it? Emilio Zapata. It was Zapata or something, right? Zapata. 1910? Yeah. Emiliano Zapata. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, listen to this. It even gets better. So Buddy says, you know what? You are full of shit. Right up to your eyebrows. Stuff is coming out all over you. Stuff is coming all over your ears and everything. Why don't you get yourself a goddamn hobby or something? Hertzberg interrupting. A number, a number of other incredibly intelligent individuals have made the same distressing noises, insisting that my daring new concept flies in the face of physics. Alas, I was, I was forced to remind them that, one, no quantum leap of human knowledge has as yet been realized by the use of the adding machine, referring obliquely to the process of bottom lining data in the ordinary computational sense. The data itself is suspect, especially when treated axiomatically in these computations. That's what LaRouche complains about the axiomatic use of this stuff. Two, axioms are subjective. Their existence is a figment of the human imagination, often based on observations made with the assistance of the aforementioned machinery designed to perform logic functions, logic functions using programs riddled with the very same axiomatic expressions which ought to be questioned. Another LaRouche statement. Three, flying in the face of physics is no big deal. None of the information gathered thus far with the assistance of trillion-dollar university amusement devices has proven anything in particle behavior inquiries. Four, all known facts pertaining to universal mechanics apply only to what people think they know. Five, all unknown facts pertaining to universal mechanics are sought in an order of priorities determined by what people think they want to know. First, will it explode? Second, how will this affect real estate values in our area? Six, even without suggesting that all human knowledge be rethought, we ought to at least consider the possibility that centuries of accumulated errors, misjudgments, inaccurate observations, erroneous evaluations of data, etc., could have emulsified into the cretin's porridge now being served up as the holy software snack pack we refer to as our body of knowledge in all matters scientific. Seven, physics, like all science, is burdened with paradoxes and contradictions which have traditionally been resolved by theories designed to provide a temporary illusion of solution. Eight, Physics only sort of works. Nine, everything only sort of works. Then a voice over the laboratory paging system announces. It's the dummy, the dummy voiceover. Emergency phone call for Mr. Wilson. There's Ray Wilson getting in here again. <laughs> <laughs> Emergency phone call. I'll probably have to do that tomorrow. He fucking will miss follow the directions. Ray can tend to do that. <laughs> Get lost. And I won't be able to call him. And I have to call his sister or daughter and say, emergency phone call, this is all going to happen tomorrow. I'll be telling him about our PDE conversion machine known as the iCell. He'll just say, Bob, you're a fucking, shut up, Bob. He's going to say to me, you're full of shit, Bob, right up to your eyebrows. <laughs> Stuff is coming out all over your ears and everything. Why don't you get yourself a goddamn hobby or something? <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, how is that for awesome statement there I just read, eh? Right in the middle yeah. of the book. It's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you say, Roxy? Like I just said, like I just said, perfect words. Perfect. Yes, perfect. And, and what what Zap is writing here is the kind of criticism that, that Ion does about regular scientific knowledge. Let me see. Is there anything else? Okay, here's some more talk. Again, more hap. Okay, so uh, Buddy picks up the phone. Is his name Buddy Wilson? I thought it was Sweeney. Oh no, that's Buddy Sweeney. That's in the other play. Okay, emergency phone call for Mr. Wilson. Buddy picks up the phone. It's Chrissy, hysterical. What was the description, Buddy? That that was the the Northern Keller Black family. Yeah. Um. It's Ray Ray Wilson Black. Uh, Buddy, the dad, Chrissy, the mom, 
Buddy Wilson. Yeah. Buddy picks up the phone. It's Chrissy, hysterical. The kids are going berserk. They insist that Uncle Willie came back. They smelled his cigar. He even tried to tickle them. So there's ghosts coming back. How's that for ionic stuff? Uh, remember, Uncle Willie died, remember? Crashed into the Christmas tree. <laughs> Buddy rushes home extremely annoyed because he doesn't believe in ghosts. Chrissy looks terrible. The kids are glazed. This is not what he expected. It looks very serious. They take him into Uncle Willie's old room. Even he can smell the cigar. He thinks for a moment, finally announcing in a not too, in a not too convincing tone that Quote, there has to be a scientific explanation for everything. In order, to support this prep, in order to support this preposterous assumption, he manufactures a fairy tale theory to explain away the whole matter. <laughs> so here's his theory. As you know, everything must pass away. And do you know why that is? It's because everything wears out. Did you ever see anything that didn't wear out? Of course not. That's because entropy is destiny and vice versa. Am I making myself clear on this topic? The kids nod negatively, so he tries it again. Well, let's look at it another way. Time is not like what people think it is. It doesn't start over here and then go over there. <laughs> he say the same thing he said 20 years ago, 20 years before. It doesn't start over here. He's consistent like me. It doesn't start over here and then go over there. Time is just one big lump of stuff. Everything is happening all the time. I can prove it to you. Wow. When you're watching TV on Channel 9, there's always something else on Channel 5. <laughs> yeah, Did we repeat. hear that? Yeah. Oh, no, actually. Yeah. Actually, we heard that earlier in this book. Uh, I'm sorry. We did hear it earlier within the same book, but I'm sure he says it yeah. in the other play. Uh, yes. So that seems to make sense to the kids. What would you say? Yes, Roxy? this is perfect explanation. Right. That's then the he goes, so, you understand. Channel 9. <laughs> There's something going on in Channel 5. Which means what I used to say, the whole parallel world stuff is all happening right on your TV set. You're going to parallel worlds by watching TV. So, he says, so you understand that? If what we're talking about here is time, and since you can already see how everything is going on all the time, then you have to understand that anyone... Time could be the same as any other time. And the only reason it doesn't get completely messed up is because God set it in order. Ain't that right? Kids go, yes, that's right. Well, I suppose now you want to know why, what all this has got to do with Uncle Willie? Am I right? Okay. Check this out. You know how because some people use too much hairspray, the ozone layer has got all these big, ugly holes in it? Cosmic rays are coming in all over the place. <laughs> the weather is completely dangerous. Yeah, you know what I mean? Well, I shouldn't I shouldn't actually be telling you about this since it's mostly top secret, but I think I can trust you folks, can't I? And, and, and the kids go, why? Of course you can. He goes, okay, now Einstein had a theory that space and time were two versions of one big thing that was indivisible, which means you can't chop it up, okay? Okay, now today we got these guys called subatomic physicists, and what they do is try to chop up the tiny stuff. How tiny? Tiny what? They want to chop up. They want to chop up a basic unit, which is both a particle and a wave, depending on how you look at it. A particle means space, and a wave means time. You know what that means? Space is time, and time is space. But what about Uncle Willie? No, the kids go, and time is space. But what about Uncle Willie? <laughs> like the, like the fourth <laughs> Yeah. Now, we get to the top secret part, and you kids better never tell nobody I'll let you in on this, especially if he looks like a communist. They go, we promise. Now, this is your parallel world. You know the other place next to where I work with the big fence and the guards and the signs that tell you to go away? You got any idea what they're doing in there? <laughs> they're messing with... <laughs> It's like the Hadron Collider. They're messing with subatomic particles. They shoot them down that long tunnel. Then they smash them up and they mash them up. They poke around in the, in the debris. Then they mess up the whatever it is they got left over. The kids go, so? Well, if these particles are waves, depending on how you look at them, and if time and space are the same thing, that means if you mess up the particles, you're messing up time, too, just like the hairspray and the ozone layer. Wayne Newton probably never wanted to hurt anybody, but look at all this skin cancer we've got going around here now. I guess Wayne Newton did a lot of hairspray. The kids, uh, do you know Wayne Newton, the entertainer? Do you know him? Yes. 
He's a big okay. Las Vegas guy. Right. The kids imagine a world full of people with skin cancer walking around like zombies, taunted by Los Angeles, taunted by Las Vegas entertainers, insouciantly fouling the biosphere with hydrocarbon propellants. So Billy says, uh, no, Buddy says, you mess with anything natural, and you can believe there's going to be something supernatural coming out of it. Every time they run that machinery over there, they could be messing up our entire chronological ozone layer. And when you mess with somebody's chronology, you stand a very good chance of putting that sucker out of sequence. Somebody that's somebody that's already been here before might come back like a ghost. Worse than that, somebody who might not have even been here yet might be arriving early. <laughs> and this is uh, to the kids. They go, this is almost starting to make sense to everybody. Realizing that he's got them hooked, Buddy declares to take it to the max. Well, he says, take it to the maxi. I'm sure you are aware of the exclusive report in the National Enquirer telling about how many ghost people have been seeing lately. Even the president thinks he saw one back around Christmas. It all fits together. Just like I told you in the beginning, everything wears out. Even time itself is going to wear out one of these days. <laughs> <laughs> and the kids go, and what's going to happen then? Then? Then we will all be together in the most profound sense of the word. Chrissy, Andrew, and Carolyn applaud enthusiastically and hug Buddy the Incredibly Smart Dead. That's in quotes, Buddy the Incredibly Smart Dead. They are interrupted by the obnoxious sound of the household smoke alarm. There appears to be a cigar butt smoldering on the rug in Uncle Willie's room. The next morning, Buddy waves goodbye and backs out of the driveway, smiling and happy as he turns on the car radio. He hears an item treated in a humorous way by the newscaster about ghostly occurrences in Palo Alto, ending with one of those horrible, lighthearted news comments regarding the number of shopping days left before Halloween. He wonders about yesterday's scientific explanation. Could any part of what he told the kids be true? He decides just as he pulls into the lab parking lot, it's all true. As he climbs out of the car, as he climbs out of his car, we catch a glimpse of the other place with the fence and the guards. God only knows what they might really be doing in there. Later, with their mouths stuffed full of sandwich material, rendering the conversation only slightly intelligible, Buddy and Hertzberg discuss chronological entropy. A question is raised regarding the possibility of controlling chronological aberrations. Hertzberg finds the concept exciting only as the germ of an idea for a new video game. Buddy, on the other hand, becomes obsessed with the idea that such, quote, temporal disturbances, unquote, could be purposefully generated. He's convinced that these selective chronological perturbations could result in the reappearance of whoever or whatever might have previously dwelt in the operational vicinity. Let's read that again. Selective chronological perturbations could result in the reappearance of whoever or whatever might have previously dwelt in the operational vicinity and allow such a person or thing to dwell again. Remember the dwell in the house of the Lord line? What, what was that in? That was in this, right? <laughs> Eventually, Hertzberg finishes, video, finishes his video game, and Buddy builds a little box with one large knob on it that says, one large knob on it that says, Dwell, capital letters, Dwell. That same night in Uncle Willie's old room with the family gathered around, I remember they had the smoke with the cigar. It appears to be a cigar butt. Actually, there is a, remember they got the smell of smoke, and then and a cigar butt shows up in Willie's room. <clears throat> that same night in Uncle Willie's old room, with the family gathered around, Buddy cautiously twirls the knob on the box. Uncle Willie reappears, seated on the bed, with his back to them, smoking a cigar and playing with the dummy. Nobody says anything. Later, unable to sleep, Buddy stares at the ceiling while Chrissy spews forth fantasy scenarios of incredible wealth and international renown, just around the corner for her and her man. She tells him that nobody's going to be impressed if he just keeps his dwell box at home for conjuring up stupid old Uncle Willie and his dummy. He needs to make somebody famous dwell again, like, for instance, Abraham Lincoln. Shortly thereafter, a group of presidential hunchmen gather around the desk in the Oval Office. They go, perfect. It's just what... Didn't you say perfect, Roxy? I think you did. Perfect. Yeah. It's just what we've been looking for. <laughs> when his wife... <laughs> When his wife first con contacted our office, there was naturally quite a bit of laughter. But then we looked into it, and quite frankly, Mr. President, this Buddy Wilson is a very amazing Negro. It's going to, and then I guess the president says, it's going to take more than an amazing Negro to help us win this election. 
Next thing we know, Buddy is standing in the hall outside the Lincoln bedroom, reporters and cameras all over the place. He opens the door, twirls the knob, and Abraham Lincoln reappears. Within a few hours, Buddy and Chrissy find themselves in the company of two sleazoid showbiz moguls in an expensive restaurant. The moguls are suggesting how Dwell could be used in the entertainment field. Mr. Gorgon Zola asks Buddy and Chrissy to imagine, quote, the potential profits from a series of classic reappearances of, for example, Elvis Presley or Jimi Hendrix. The first annual Elvis Presley classic reappearance concert is a tremendous... Oh, so then they do it. The first annual Elvis Presley classic reappearance concert is a, concert is a tremendous success. Mr. Gorgonzola hands Buddy a suitcase full of money. <laughs> <laughs> Look where we're going. Where the hell are we going with this? Uh, in his fancy new... <laughs> <laughs> in his fancy New York hotel room after the concert, Buddy is drunk. He picks up the dwell box and talks to it. You have made me a lot of money, and you have made me famous. Ha! Ah, you even made some, Repub some Republicans look good for a minute. Now, don't try to deny it. You only got about $15 <laughs> worth of shit in you. <laughs> you only got about $15 worth of shit in you. That's right. You heard me. Ain't you ashamed of yourself? <laughs> He gives the knob an arrogant tweeze and quite unexpectedly finds himself face to face with old Zircon. Not just some guy with an English accent wearing a cape and a shitty little pointed beard. This is the real ugly, horrible, blood curdling, bad smelling, totally dangerous devil. <laughs> He's standing right there. <laughs> He's standing right there next to the bed with the long tail, the cloven hooves, the horns, the pitchfork, the sulfurous reek, etc. <laughs> Laughing his traditional scary laugh. After causing an assortment of objects to whiz around the room, he exits, scorching his way through the door. Television coverage of old Zircon's activities make big news. Kelly Lang. Now, Kelly Lang was a reporter for LA TV, and she lived right across the street from Frank. They were friends. So he puts in Kelly Lang. Television coverage of old Zircon's activities make big news. Kelly Lang even had to report on it. Quote, Incredibly perverse acts attributed to old Zircon as he cavorts around Manhattan. Film at 11. Unquote. You know, what Kelly M. even had to report on it. That's probably a phrase she said to Frank. I even had to report on it. In the early ABC coverage, old Zircon, now this is like Billy the Mountain back in 1971, trudging across the, the desert to go to Las Vegas. Billy the Mountain and his tree. His wife is a little tree. And remember at the beginning of this, Mountain showed up? One of the plays, Mountain showed up. In the early ABC coverage, old Zircon is shown hurling the doorman at regimes, the doorman at regimes into the middle of Park Avenue after having been questioned about his attire. Old Zircon is shown in early ABC coverage hurling the doorman at regimes into the middle of Park Avenue after having been questioned about his attire. He's then shown entering the disco area where hundreds of beautiful people bask in each other's radiance. With one wave of a scabrous hand, the head of each beautiful person rotates 360 degrees, spewing green mucus as if, as if they were a room full of exorcist lawn sprinklers. <laughs> <laughs> exorcist lawn sprinklers. One wave of a scabrous hand. As they twirl and spew, old Zircon lectures to them. Uh-oh, we're going to hear another guy talk about how there's no, no time. Old Zircon lectures to them, strolling about the room like, like some. Now, in 1980, holy shit, in August 84, I met with Frank in a disco on the uh, corner of uh, 6th Avenue and West 20th Street, which was formerly William Irwin Thompson's church, the Limelight Church, now a Limelight Club. I've talked about it many times. And... He wrote this after he met me in a fucking disco. This is again inspired by me. Because it's, it's 84, man. He's, re he's re writing this after meeting me in August, where I tell him about, about uh, um, May Brussel and all that and arrange for the tapes. And then we meet in November in Nova Scotia. But in between, he's writing this. This is copyright 1984, man. Look, he's a fucking disco. Bob in a disco. So he's probably going to quote me here. So, so old Zircon lectures to them, strolling about the room like some kind of dangerous professor. That's what he thought I was, some kind of dangerous professor. 
Uncle Willie's dummy. <laughs> <laughs> I look like when I played ball hockey in the seventies. The, the young kid said, they "Called me the professor." They look like a fucking professor. <laughs> Uncle Willie's dummy is twirling and retching at a table near the dance floor. Old Zircon singles it out as the focus of his of his lecture. He says, "Quote: Eventually, it was discovered that God did not want us all." Excuse me. Eventually, it was discovered that God did not want us to be all the same. This was bad news for the governments of the world, as it seemed contrary to the doctrine of portion-controlled servings. Mankind must be made more uniform if the future was going to work. Various ways were sought to bind us all together, but alas, sameness was unenforceable. It was about this time that someone... Now, this is in thinking of Paris, too. It was about this time that someone came up with the idea of total criminalization based on the principle that if we were all crooks, we could at last be uniform to some degree in the eyes of the law. Shrewdly, our legislators calculated that most people were too lazy to commit a real crime, so new laws were manufactured, making it impossible for anyone to violate them. No, making it impossible for anyone to violate them, any time of the day or night. And once we had all broken some kind of law, we'd all be in the same big happy club. Remember I used to talk about, let's all go to, they do federal, federal, Emergency measures, let's all just give up and go to jail. They have to feed us. Remember that idea? <laughs> <laughs> We'd all be in the same big happy club, right up there with the president, the most exalted industrialist, and the clerical big shots of all your favorite religions. Those guys are already being in jail. He sloshes through the rising pea soup tide, wagging his finger in faces of the dummies, giving them that dead serious Smith Barney, we earn it sort of look. You know Smith Barney, the accounting firm or whatever commercials uh, they had that old guy he played a Smith Barney we earn it dead serious Smith Barney we earn it sort of look total criminalization was the greatest idea of its time and it was vastly popular except for those people who didn't want to be crooks or outlaws so of course they had to be tricked into it which is one of the reasons why music was eventually made illegal so what he's doing here is he's laying out the Joe's garage scenario where Lugo, music is outlawed. So I won't read all that and uh, see how it ends. So uh, the central, the central scrutinizer. Okay, so now it brings in the central scrutinizer. The central scrutinizer but, uh, hovers um, in Cindy. I'm sorry, this has to do with what you were talking about at the beginning of payday this um, digital prohibition, how the laws are oh, so yeah. absurd that anybody can commit a crime. You download the or, video. When you use it, it's against yeah. the law to use your computer. <laughs> they criminalize everybody. That's a good point. <laughs> it syncs up. Great synchronicity there. The, the whole digital prohibition, this is what she's really talking about. I told her she left out Zappa. But I told you guys, she has to be told you left out Zappa. Zappa's already dealing with it. Right. Yeah, that's that's pretty good. Yeah, Bert, what puny idea have you got compared to Roxy's? Uh oh, did, did you say, get say again, Bob, say again, Bob. No, no. I'm said, here. What puny <laughs> idea you got compared to Roxy's huge binding insights? Was this all connected? I mean, you play, you've read two different play, screenplays, but it seems that there's a link. Between. Yeah, it's all the same play. It's always the same fucking thing. <laughs> well, that, all times that, that was his concept that, um, but for some, for Frank, everything is connected. <laughs> everything is a, it's yeah. the same conversation. Yeah, the same conceptual continuity. He no, got he's, such he's, a big idea in, in 1962 that he... He then could, his mind could only do fragments of it, but he was always doing the same big scenario and chopping off pieces from it. But I he was, was a cartoonist. <laughs> what? Was Frank a cartoonist? Was Frank a cartoonist? Did he like cartoons? As a kid, yes. Or he he drew cartoons okay. as a kid and things. He did all kinds of drawing. Yes. He also okay, used so to I'm play with that picture. No, I'm getting that picture because he has a common his. Uh, Listening to this, it's like a combination of uh, cartoon, slapstick, 
and movie all mixed, and then he mixes the uh, 60s type humor as far as how people use language. Like, uh, you right. understand where I'm coming from, and uh, yeah. can you, you know. You know it's, where it's, it's at. It's really beautiful. It's be- yeah, it knows where it's at. Yeah, it's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, he's taking the, the cliches of the day and immediately shining them back at people. Yeah. And he's making big co- – he's actually putting together the slang people said and putting – making order out of where it's at, where I'm coming from, <laughs> which way does the went go. <laughs> he's, he's organizing the slang around him and making a big yeah. theory. So the central scrutinizer, central scrutinizer hovers in the vicinity of Uncle Willie's dummy. He looks like a cheap sort of flying saucer, about five feet across with a snout-like megaphone apparatus in the front with two big eyes mounted like Appleton's and a pair of miniature motorized frowning chrome eyebrows directly above. Along the edge of his disc-like body are several sets of stupid-looking headers and exhaust hoses which apparently propel him and punctuate his dialogue with horrible-smelling smoke rings. In the, middle of his, uh, um, in the middle of his head, he has an airport windsock and constantly twirling an anometer. The bottom of him has a, has a landing light and three spoked wheels. In spite of all this, it is obvious that the way he really gets around is by being dangled from place to place by a union guy with a dark green shirt up in the roof eating a sandwich pieces of which drop off every once in a while and lodge themselves near the hole where they put the oil that makes the cheap smoke. <laughs> Hovering near Kissinger's dummy, he announces. So that was a description of the central scrutinizer. Central scrutinizer. He had a green shirt sort of like um, Rance Muhammad's at the beginning. This is the central scrutinizer. It is my responsibility to enforce all the laws that haven't been passed yet. It is also my... Re- Remember, a lie is a truth that hasn't happened yet. So they've brought in these laws that haven't been passed yet. It's also my responsibility to alert each and every one of you to the potential consequences of various ordinary everyday activities you might be performing, which could eventually lead to the death penalty or affect your parents' credit credit rating. (laughs) He slides above the twirling heads, pooting nasty little smoke rings downward, forming halos. There's Roxy's halos forming halos over the individual singled out for derision. In spite of the central scrutinizer's lecture, a number of beautiful people remain on the dance floor as twirling dummies, doing that ugly dance they always do there. He hovers toward them and says, "Uh, Our criminal institutions are full of little creeps like you who who do wrong things, and many of them were driven to these crimes by a horrible force called music. Our studies have shown that this horrible force is so dangerous <laughs> is so dangerous to society at large that laws are being drawn up at this very moment to stop it forever. Cruel and inhuman punishments are being carefully described in tiny paragraphs so they won't conflict with the Constitution, which itself is being modified in order to accommodate the future. I'm not going to read any more, but the... Uh, but the, at, the uh, at the very beginning of his career, he had this situation where he was accused of... Uh, you making framed. some type of porn, yeah. And, uh, yeah, fake crime, a non-crime. Um, yeah, so the it can it you can be criminalized even if you don't commit any crime. They can frame you. Yeah, that's that's a really good interpretation of digital prohibition. They're making a like, simple, you know, copying. It's going to be a crime, and they're already busting people for it. <laughs> they don't follow the fair use, so. That's a that's a that's a scenario that if I could tell Carolyn Guertin it, you know, make her look at how Zappa is is coming up with the same idea already. Maybe she isn't aware that that's how simple it is. They're trying to make everybody a criminal, and they and they don't implement it. They just do it, you know, as a punishment force. Nail someone here and there who who they think deserves to get nailed, but they could subtly arrest everybody if they needed to, and they could cite the law. You're not allowed to download. It's right in the right in the books. Yes, like anyways. Berg was saying. Berg was saying they're going to be treated like a potential terrorists in any stadium. They are going to control you and search you, like in the airports and right. And, uh, yeah, that's the situation. Pretty neat, eh? So I think 
that's quite a way to end. So you zap a fans, you see how it does come back to what Carolyn wanted to talk about. Um, about 10 hours ago. <laughs> <What is it? laughs> it's coming up to 10 to 3. We started at 3 12 hours ago, for fuck's sake. We started on this rant 12 hours ago. <laughs> The forcing be with you. The yeah, forcing. be the forcing, the little forcing. Be at least your butler, at least <laughs> echo you in a chorus. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to read these plays in detail over the next week or so and uh, find out all the missing neat parts. This is just based on a scan. You had the cold fusion, you had time travel. And we suddenly finally realized him and Beefheart actually knew who they were. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's that's really cool. That's really cool. Yeah, Even they it, found it, out they both were from other worlds and been around for thousands of years. <laughs> 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 no wonder Frank was so smart. I mean, he could just spew and, and be intelligent and common, comment on anything at the top of his head. He was an intergalactic intelligence <laughs> from another world. And there he is on the cover of Them or Us. It's just a picture of him with his scraggly hair and his chest showing and a nice suit, suit on. And it shows him holding his left hand with a green glove, green cooking glove, in a fist shape. He's, yeah, he's holding up because, the glove very um, menacingly. I mean, it's really impressive that he said he was self-taught um, in music and he's making these super complex things. So it will make sense that um, he has been around since the Baroque times. And Good point. He actually yeah. knows to yeah. do his a lot. Yeah. To, <laughs> and, you know what? He, and, and that song on, on We're Only for the Money, We Are the Mother People, We Are the Other People, found a way to get to you. Remember he started off we reading those early interviews? He said, we can right. use right. The, the rock music to get to people. Like they, it, it was the first time Parallel Worlders could actually have a medium, the radio, teen radio, and get in there. And you're right. He's been around for hundreds of years. That's why he can play so fantastic. He's been practicing. Yeah. And, and he couldn't get played anywhere until teen music showed up. And then he could infiltrate it. Lucky well, Gail died. She wouldn't be able to take this. <laughs> Gail, unless Gail knew. But uh, uh, Gail, could she take these concepts? Did she know who she was living with? She does say that the first night she slept with Frank in 1966, around the time Lenny Bruce died, in August 66, I think, she woke up the next morning and um, herself, uh, she was hallucinating. She describes it in some book. I might have it. I should find it and read it. She, she goes through this psychic vision after a night with Frank, probably, you know, gets zapped. Her chi gets zapped by the eye cell Bob energies coming out of Frank. She fucks Bob. She fucked me. <laughs> but you know that makes. That's pretty I mean, good. it's it's a good connection that he could have been that because I mean, if you think about, he programmed. I mean, he self-taught music, classical yeah. music, and enjoyed it. It didn't like you know the the Bach and all that yeah. stuff. Didn't He's like from it. another he era. Write it. Yeah, <laughs> but then he could take create music that was actually adaptable to now, the digital age. I mean, we're listening to his music now and able to hear it clearly than it was when he yeah. did it, until, uh, unless yeah. he heard, um, until he heard it when he produced it, but the people, they didn't play it on the radio, you couldn't hear it on the LP, but now you play his music and hear it. I mean, it's possible he was a, or he was a parallel world person. I mean, for me, yeah. it makes sense. Multiple <laughs> dimensional. Yeah, he was yeah. just telling the facts. It wasn't hard for him to write this stuff. It was normal conversation for him. <laughs> and he kept repeating himself. That's all he had to say. Hey, buddy, you fucking little earthlings, you don't realize what's going on, and this is what's going on. I'll repeat it again for the hundredth time, you know. It's all happening at once. So in light of this, we should play a, an interesting piece of music, right? Let's play some Zappa music. Right. What do you think? Yeah, there you go. All right. Yes, this is called a... <laughs> what? <laughs> My central magnitude? I, or, you, you I call said, me yes, your magnitude. <laughs> your magnitude. Yeah, you son of monster magnet. You. 
Okay, let's let's just see. But wait a minute. Poor Jean. Like, where is anybody? Is there anybody hanging around here? Oh, look, Bill, Bill gave me the stats. Dig this. There are 52 people on their computers listening. <laughs> Wow, I'll just fucking crazy. call in and talk. Oh, hello, Forsling Force. Yeah, the Forslings are still here. They're afraid to talk to us. They know we'll find out who they are, but these are probably tapped into other worlds, 52 different worlds listening. <laughs> and remember, I'm saying this, the Zappa fans, if they've gotten this far going, who the fuck are these people? This is neater than <laughs> Frank. This is freakier than Beef Art. These people got themselves believing Frank is a thousand years old. Yeah. Uh, then every let, once in a while they talk uh, about this weird guy named Ion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they claim it all began with Ion and ended up with Ion. Um, I, I was talking about um, Jürgen Habermas, how he said... Habermas. Uh, Habermas. Habermas, okay. He... <laughs> He said uh, the the bourgeois created these new forums to express themselves, but it was actually the white bourgeois, the, the male bourgeois. And Frank Zappa made it. Uh, wait, wait! Uh, I'm not sure what you're what? saying. Are you saying Baudrillard? Who are you saying? No, 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 no. Jürgen Habermas, how do you say? Oh, the bourgeois, uh, the bourgeoisie. Yeah, um, but it was. It was not a real participatory democracy. It was more like the male, white, yeah. that was expressing, verbalizing in the public sphere. Right. It's a left but, hemisphere. Uh, print, print hoists up the left hemisphere, which is what men do. That's why the men took over under print, favored their left hemisphere. Yes, and um, Frank Zappa uh, promoted because it's very recent that other people, like other freaks, other outcasts, other uh, genders, yeah. uh, other ethnicities, could access this verbalization in the public sphere, the public <laughs> sphere. <laughs> um, but uh, he he made it. Um, he always promoted this. Um, Presenting outcasts, freaks, um, yeah, yeah. Baby races, the, the subtitle, women. The subtitle of the Baby Face movie is "People Who Are Not Normal or Who Do Things Not Normal." That that's right in the subtitle of the movie, Baby Snakes, late seventies. Yes, and and in his um, pedagogic uh, political video, he he also explains how all these. Population could not vote, and, and until very recently, if you were gay, you had to stay in the closet in order to participate in, in the public or in the political life. Right. And, uh, uh, he also says um, you had to own property to, to have access to some offices, to some of the political jobs you needed to yeah. to own some property right. so we are the parallel world let known people joining the public sphere yes we are the people who are not of verbalizing the fourth thing <laughs> the new media the new coffee <laughs> shop Yes. Finding <laughs> okay, well, yeah, human. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, it's like it, 200 years ago it was organizing the bourgeois, print organized the bourgeois. Well, digital media organized the not human, the people who are not. <laughs> okay. Yes, anyone's ever Getting themselves in the open kite and the openness for the first time, usually they keep quiet. They don't go right. public. But now that nobody's listening and too busy nano broadcasting themselves, we can come out and speak. <laughs> <laughs> nobody's listening. <laughs> nano TV.
The, the 54 links. Yeah, 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 the 54 links. Okay, so let's play um, uh, a token of my extreme from Joe's Garage, 
you guys catch those lyrics? Did you hear what it said? Not really, but it, um, it, quite, I it was quite funny. So yeah, but did I you notice it seemed to be, did you guys notice the distortion? It sounded like extra echoey or something. Yes, yes, I did notice that, yeah. That's why I couldn't I don't know what that really make out the words, make but out I was words. hearing something, but it was, yeah. Seem to be something extra weird. Uh, okay, here's the lyrics. Don't you be terrified, T A R O T, you know, the terror. Don't you <laughs> yeah, be the terror terrified of the, of the, of the terror, okay. Is the, the word of the day, the terror, the terrifying. Yes. It, it's it's just a, a nice message. My... He's telling us today, don't be terrified. Right. It's just a token of my extreme. Don't you be terrified. It's just a token of my extreme. Don't you never try to look behind my eyes. You're not allowed to find out what Zappa was. You don't want to know what they have seen. Don't you never try to look behind my eyes. You don't want to know what they have seen. Then he says, some people think that if they go too far, they'll never get back to where the rest of them are. That's the whole thing about parallel worlding. You worry about whether you'll get back. Yeah. <laughs> Some people think that if they go too far, they'll never get back to where the rest of them are. I might be crazy, but there's one thing I know. You might be surprised at what you find when you go. Damn. Gee, that, he, that's all it says. So that implies parallel worlding because when you go to Las Vegas, you know, it doesn't give a noun. It just says the going. You know, when people talk about parallel worlding with Ion, they say, well, when we go, we'll end up there. And when will we be able to get back? So then it says, hmm. Joe asked L. Ron Hoover, head of the Church of Appliantology, Joe, oh, 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 mystical advisor, what is my problem? Tell me, can you see? And L. Ron Hoover says, well, you have nothing to fear, my son. You are a latent appliance fetishist, it appears to me. Joe says, that all seems very, very strange. I never craved a toaster or a color TV. Ron, L. Ron Hoover says, a latent Appliance fetishist is a person who refuses to admit to his or herself that sexual gratification can only be achieved through the use of machines. Get the picture? Joe says, are you telling me I should come out of the closet now, Mr. Ron? Ron Hoover says, no, my son. You must go into the closet, and you will have a lot of fun. That's where they all live. So if you want an appliance to love you, you'll have to go in there and get you one. Well, Joe says, that seems simple enough. L. Ron Hoover, yes, but if you want a really good one, you'll have to learn a foreign language. German, a uh, Joe. German, for instance? L. Ron Hoover, that's right. A lot of really cute ones come from over there. Fifty bucks, please. And a cheerful group of appliantologists dance it. So here we have, this is like the four slings. He repeats that whole thing. And a cheerful group of appliantologists dance into the room wearing aluminum foil lab smocks. There's the science part. Lock arms in a circle around Joe, making sure he pays in full, all the while singing with L. Ron as he delivers his final instructions. It says, if you've been modified, it's an illusion, and you're in between. Don't you be terrified. It's just a lot of nothing. So what can it mean? If you've been modified, it's an illusion, and you're in between. Don't you be terrified. It's just a lot of nothing. So what can it mean? Joe leaves the first church of appliantology and sets out to try L. Ron, uh, oh, and sets out to try L. Ron's expensive advice. 
So, um, enough of that. I think we got to stop. I think we better get on to the uh, rewrite. Can you guys take it? Are you going to go to sleep while I play to, for myself? And the 59 people listening? <laughs> Rewrite. Ready, How far did we? Are you ready? For yeah. Ion. But we have to say that was a good Zappa session, and there's. I mean, I know Rox, you get a whole bunch of notes. I didn't get to the to the um, Civilization Phase Three. We need to go through some of those lyrics. Um. But there's Frank standing in the midst of art, science, nature, and death, and making fun of it all. Don't you be terrified. <laughs> Bob, you said last week that Frank recognized that all there was was media, and he his goal yeah. was to become an anti-environment. And what you just read or what has been discussed, it's really clear. He used everything and anything that he could just to make that point. Yeah. He made himself look point. stupid, silly, juvenile, yeah. all kinds of crap that no one would ever normally do. Yeah. But then if he went on the interview, like when he was on Howard Stern, he really was a very intelligent person. I mean, he really had depth. Yeah. You could tell yeah. in his interviews yeah. he had depth. Yeah. He had something to say. He Well, yeah. he, by coming across seriously he, in the – Fun environment of radio, he would come in as an anti environment of seriousness and then teach people stuff. Say things they, like Howard and, and Robin, you know, were sort of taken by the seriousness of what he was saying. They sort of stopped yeah. his silly bantering. Yeah. Is that, is that, is that uh, interview with Hal Stern? Is that on YouTube? Do you know, Bob? I like to listen to that. No, or is it just it's, it's, I think that's it's, one of your private clips? Yeah, I got that from Henry Greenbaum. I don't know, but you can hear it in my furry lint. Oh, but but um, okay. uh, I could play it sometime. Um, it's long, you know. There's a good stretch, and but you can't get into Fire Body. Five Body dot com is being repaired, so but I could probably find it in my archive, my own files, and then we could play it. It's, it's a good long rant if you haven't heard it. I mean, it's no. fun. <laughs> So I have here stopped at Event Horizon. So here we – are you guys ready, Roxy? Are you ready for this? You ready to listen? She didn't make it. She collapsed. Where is she? She got disconnected. Yeah, let me see. Where's the uh, web control? Yes, you got disconnected. Sorry, sorry there, Roxy. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Are, are you ready? Are you ready to hear Ion's resonant voice for another three hours? Yes, your wonderment. <laughs> wonderment. We are, we are on duty. Your magnitude. <laughs> we are learning. Laughing and learning. <laughs> yes, that was real fun. I really like this. Uh, yes. This uh, type These of scripts. words. Just... Yeah, yeah. So we will. I'll try to read through many of them and find out the other juicy parts. I'll read them. And I, you know, I assume I, I've got these at one place, maybe a, a convention. Nicely typed up, and I don't know how available they are. They may be pretty rare. Maybe Zed and Zappa trading guys, they send this around, but it was a good find. <laughs> 